Welcome to the channel and welcome to episode 16. If you're new to this, my counterpart Bruce and I are a couple of dads who, oddly enough, talk tech. That's correct, Keith, and we do have some tech to talk today. Wow, that's amazingly close to a tongue twister. So did I read the script correctly? We're talking about Giggy? Getting jiggy with it. Kind of. We're actually going to be talking about 10 gigabit Ethernet. I can't really say I know that song. Well, actually, Will Smith was saying getting jiggy with it, not gig E. You know, I wondered how Will knew so much about technology, especially like way back in the day when that song was recorded. So back to 10 gig Ethernet. Yeah, let's get jiggy with that. See what I did there? Yes. Yes, I did. Oh, come on, man. I'm only as good as the material I'm given. Fair enough. So let me just note before we get started here that most of our audience doesn't actually need 10 gigabit Ethernet. Well, I guess it's a good thing that we're spending an entire episode on it then. I suppose I deserved that. Yes. Yes, you did. Let me explain my statement for a minute. See, most people are only going to have, at most, one gigabit Ethernet in their homes. So anything over that one gigabit threshold is going to be overkill. Even if they're like me, and they feel the need for- Don't say it! For speed! There. I didn't say it. Feels like you did. I'd ask for a video replay, but those never seem to go the way that people want them to, so let's just go ahead and move on. That's probably a good idea. You know, I'm the replay ref for this episode, and I can tell you right now, getting that call overturned is probably not likely to happen. Okay, so anyway, I actually have a very specific need for having a portion of my network be 10 gigabit Ethernet. I have two computers that have shared storage, a QNAP NAS device, or network attached storage. Okay, okay, so you have a network attached storage device on your home network, and then you've got multiple computers accessing that same storage. Spot on, Keith. So the two computers I'm most concerned with having high-speed access to data are the ones that I use for processing photos and editing video, including the videos that we use for our channel. Okay, so I see where this is heading. You know, video editing requires really fast access to these files, otherwise it's gonna, I don't know, slow you down. Absolutely. So the QNAP device I have has been connecting to my PC via Thunderbolt connection. And Thunderbolt is actually a very high-speed connection. The problem is the implementation on Windows or maybe QNAP or both is spotty at best. See, it actually makes the Thunderbolt adapter appear as an Ethernet adapter. So it's encapsulating that Thunderbolt traffic as Ethernet. They call that Thunderbolt to Ethernet or T2E. So what makes that so bad? So for most users, it's the complexity of the setup and the need to route all traffic, including internet traffic, through the QNAP device that's going to be the major issue. My system always had a pop-up message I couldn't make go away, and when my setup was correct, if my system went to sleep or rebooted, I'd have to reconfigure it all over again. Honestly, it's just not quite as easy using Thunderbolt with the Windows environment versus a Mac. And for me to complement a Mac, well, you know that's a big deal. Sorry, you're going to have to warn me next time you say something nice about Macs. I almost fell off the couch and knocked my pineapple over in the process. So where does this get into the 10G Ethernet realm anyway? Well, the QNAP model I have ships with 10 gigabit Ethernet right out of the box. Now, it won't be as fast as the Thunderbolt, but from an easy use and still giving me high speed access with multiple systems perspective, it's going to be good enough. And from the benchmarks that we're going to discuss, I don't think I was getting anywhere close to the theoretical speeds that Thunderbolt is supposed to be able to achieve, at least not all the time. So 10 gigabit Ethernet should give me plenty of speed to edit directly from the QNAP device. So it sounds like, in theory, Thunderbolt 3 is a really fast connection. It should be up to like 40 gigabits per second. But in practice, with your setup, it's really not, is that right? That is correct. Now, understand that the cable I have is really only rated for 20 gigabits per second, but even in the benchmarking that we're gonna discuss, we're performing well below that metric as well. And to be perfectly honest, in the various setups that I've had to go through to make the Thunderbolt 3 work, I have seen better speeds at times. So I probably do have some type of configuration issue that I'm dealing with, but here's the thing, setting up a NAS and a PC together shouldn't be so difficult. As well, I shouldn't have to modify the configuration on a regular basis. That whole thing is very frustrating to me, so I can only imagine someone with less technical expertise trying to work with something like this, how they would feel. It probably should have been a hint to me that every review that I saw on the internet discussing the QNAP and a Windows system 
was really showing the Windows system being connected via 10 gigabit Ethernet versus the Thunderbolt 3, but I wanted to give it a try. So for me, in the end, the juice just isn't worth the squeeze. So that's why I want to look at 10 gigabit Ethernet versus Thunderbolt 3. So I know you're about to go into an unboxing and a setup discussion here in a little bit, but before we do that, I'd like to talk a little bit about who might be interested in you know, a 10 gigabit setup. I know that uh, you know, some people should be interested in this, but maybe some people should not be given the monetary investment involved. Yeah, thanks for bringing us back to the original topic of who would benefit from 10 gigabit ethernet and who would just be wasting money since it is pretty pricey for even a small implementation. I would say that 10 gigabit ethernet is going to benefit anyone that has two or more systems that they want to move large files between very quickly. Now those two or more systems could be say two PCs or network attached storage and a PC. Obviously if you have two PCs and network attached storage that creates additional value proposition having that 10 gigabit ethernet because now both systems have high speed access to that shared storage at the same time. So having that NAS and multiple systems accessing the same files gives you the ability to create workflows that allow you to move data much more quickly and be more efficient. Okay, so to be clear here, someone who just has one PC or maybe someone who has multiple PCs, but they're just, you know, surfing the internet or just streaming content, you know, from YouTube or whatever, Netflix to multiple locations, even in that situation, they're probably not gonna benefit from this. Is that right? I think for most scenarios, that's probably pretty accurate. But it's unlikely that 10 gigabit ethernet's gonna create any real problems for people other than maybe cabling distance limitations, 30 meters for that 10 gigabit ethernet over copper. Where it is going to create more of an issue is on the financial side of things. So my small three node network was over $400 to set up because I needed to buy a switch and cabling and two network adapters because my PCs didn't come enabled with 10 gigabit right out of the box. Okay, good. Yeah, that gives me a good frame of reference. I suppose it's not entirely unlike other newer technologies where being an early adopter means you pay more. That's exactly right. I remember back a few years ago when gigabit ethernet had a premium over 100 megabit ethernet. Give it a few years and I'm sure we'll be laughing at the investment that it took to get 10 gigabit ethernet today. Yeah, you got that right. So for you, it's gonna be mostly about copying and editing these large video files for the channel, correct? Keith, that was definitely a big factor. But also understand that in my personal life, I take about 40,000 photos of my kids plus video every single year. So having a device that I could store and edit and transfer for backups those files quickly was also an important factor in my buying decision. Oh, well, that makes perfect sense to me now. So why don't you help us dip our toes into this 10 gigabit ethernet pool here and uh, show us what it takes to get it set up and maybe share with us some performance numbers that you were able to get you know, before and after the upgrade. Yeah, let's go ahead and jump in. I feel like we've been talking about this forever and Honestly, I'm the kind of person that likes to, to jump in and get my hands on things. Okay, let's uh, spend a little time going through the hardware that uh, is involved in this 10 gigabit ethernet upgrade. So let's start with the switch. So I've got the box here sitting on the desk. Let's go ahead and go through some of the hardware that's involved with doing our 10 gigabit uh, ethernet upgrade here. So we have the uh, first component, which is the switch. It's a, a Microtech router board, and it's got a couple different functions it can perform. It does come with the AC adapter, so that's uh, nice that it's included. Let's go ahead and put that aside. And then um, the switch itself is actually uh, super small, right? So uh, this is a five port device. It comes with one gigabit ethernet, uplink and PoE uh, capable uh, port. This is going to give us our uplink to my other switch. So the only devices that we're going to put in this particular 10 gigabit switch um, are going to be those uh, PCs, the two PCs that I want to connect, and the NAS device for my storage. Uh, so all the data that goes from our episodes that I edit, um, all of that stored in there. Plus, um, I've got it sectioned off so that there's a piece for the YouTube uh, data as well. All of my family uh, data gets stored in there. So all the photos that I take of my daughters doing, you know, various activities, volleyball and show choir and uh, band uh, competitions. So I take lots of photos, um, quite a bit of video as well, and that consumes a lot of storage. These particular ports, if you'll notice, I'm going to pull out one of the plugs uh, that's protecting it. 
uh, that does not look like an RJ45 Ethernet, and it's because it's not. This is what they call an SFP uh, port. So that requires either a module or a cable that's capable of being plugged directly into this particular port. Okay, so um, I mentioned that I had to get uh, 10 gigabit Ethernet cards because neither of my PCs have 10 gigabit integrated. One has 5 gigabit and the other has uh, just uh, it's old enough that it's only gigabit uh, Ethernet. So in order to get that 10 gigabit access I needed to actually purchase two of these cards. So I have two of the exact same TrendNet uh, devices. They are also SFP uh, module based uh, cards. So these are not going to be over copper. And actually, in the long run, that actually saves me a little bit of money because I don't have to buy a separate SFP module. I'll actually just connect this uh, with a special cable that I ordered. And I'm going to show you that cable in just a minute here. Connect that with a special cable to both the card and to the switch. And neither one of them requires a separate SFP module to do so. The card itself comes with two uh, slot covers. And so one of them is a low profile card. So if you do have a low profile uh, system, you can install that and um, use it either way. It also has the full height, which is what my use case is going to be, the full height uh, card. So I did mention an SFP module. So what does that do? Well, that takes that SFP port and turns it into another media type. In this case, I actually needed an RJ45 10 gig copper uh, based uh, interface for the NAS device, which is what it has natively on it. So you can see, uh, just holding this up like that, um, that this module is going to take that SFP type port, sorry for the noise there, and convert it to RJ45. So let's see if we can get the autofocus in on that. So you can see that is a standard networking cable or RJ45. Now you do need to make sure that if you're gonna go with 10 gig, you're gonna to need to get some different cabling, okay? So you're gonna need at least CAT6. I actually purchased CAT7 uh, for this one system that's going to be connected via the copper, uh, as they call it, or RJ45 uh, base connector. So if you are gonna shop for a module, make sure that you get the 10 gig module. They do make gigabit uh, modules, so you would hate to get that uh, module, put all this work into that, and then ultimately, the device that you've picked is actually only good for gigabit, which is what pretty much any computer that you're going to try and connect is already going to have the support for natively. Let's uh, take a look at actually how we use um, the switch and the module together. So uh, if you notice, we've got our four ports. They're all with uh, plugs. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, for no other reason just to get it away from the other uh, connections, I'm going to go ahead and plug in our uh, 10 gig SFP module. So you do have to pay attention to the orientation of this module. And so uh, if you notice on the bottom end of this, it has get the autofocus. See that uh, connector element there? You're going to want to link that uh, line with the connector element in the port, which in this case is on the bottom. So I simply slide this in. Going to stick out of the device a bit so that we can make our connection thing that uh, I thought is kind of cool um, on a device this level, this switch, uh, by the way, I think I mentioned the whole package, right, is over $400 between this SFP module, two of the cables that are going to uh, plug in here, and I'll show you how that's going to connect, and two of the network adapters and the RG45 cable to connect this up. Uh, over $400 uh, in equipment in order to get three systems connected, right? The two PCs and the NAS connected up. This $130 switch literally right now is the least expensive multi-port, meaning more than one 10 gig port uh, device that's out there. And that's of, the, of this uh, shooting, right? So one thing that's interesting is it actually supports connecting up two, right? So these are not different power standards, but two of this same power connector. So if you wanted to make sure that if a power supply went out, your networking didn't uh, fail, uh, that you've got that capability here. So that's that's actually pretty um, pretty nice feature for something this inexpensive. So we talked about uh, cabling just a little bit. And so I did purchase uh, two of these 10 gig SFP uh, plus module cables. And so what they've done is they've actually put the SFP connection on both ends of this cable. And now it is one that uh, they want you to be kind of delicate with because it's uh, actually using fiber. And the fiber uh, can either be a very finely polished uh, glass or plastic. 
product. But either way, um, you should not try and run this uh, someplace where you're going to have to make a hard angle or make a hard bend um, because it can damage the cabling. And so I'm just going to show you real quick here what this looks like plugged into both the card and the cable. Now you can see I have these two connections plugged in. Let me just zoom in just a little bit for you. And see, there you go. So that's what the switch is going to look like. There's actually going to be another cable uh, right next to it that's going to have the connection, or I might plug it into three just to keep the, it separate. And I'm probably going to write uh, something on these cables in order to denote which computer is plugged into what. So if I have to troubleshoot anything, I've got those identified uh, separately. Okay, lastly, the things that I wanted to show you is the actual RJ45 or copper cable that's going to connect the NAS to the switch. Those SFP to SFP cables, um, they're very economical. It was $14 for one of those cables. Um, I want to say this cable was probably close to the same range. So really what you eliminate when you do that is this SFP module that uh, is plugged in here. That's $38. And so, um, you know, $13, or excuse me, $14 compared to the $38 plus the cost of the cable is obviously more expensive than that SFP as long as the device that you're trying to connect is SFP on uh, both ends. And so when you go to plug these in, so you can see you need to make sure that that tab is oriented in the opening in the switch so that they align and when you go to plug them in you can just simply slide that cable in. Uh, with that I'm going to go ahead and get this equipment installed into my uh, two computers and connect up the NAS device and then run some benchmarking. Keith, so you may have noticed during the unboxing that I skipped the installation of the cards into the PC and some of the cabling setup for the sake of time. Yeah, sure, that works for me. But I do have to say, show me the numbers. Okay, so I did some benchmarking prior to the upgrade, both for the machine that had the gigabit ethernet connection as well as the Thunderbolt 3. As you can see, the numbers look good for the Thunderbolt 3 and 10 gigabit ethernet. I believe the right numbers for the Thunderbolt reflect the TDE overhead. And this performance is actually on a 10 core i9 processor system. The other computer that we're going to discuss is an i7, and I'll be sure to highlight when we're talking about the i7 versus the i9 performance. Okay, so speaking of the i7 versus the i9, the i7 isn't built nearly as beefy as the i9 is, and the i9 is much newer. It's a 10-core i9-9900X versus a 4-core i7-4700K. Obviously, the gigabit to 10 gig upgrade was huge for this system. Okay, on the first random 4K results, I'm not sure these numbers aren't being influenced by something other than the network. I also found it interesting that the 10 gigabit Ethernet write numbers were faster than the read. That's usually not the case, but sometimes you see some curious results when benchmarking. I'm not trying to hang my hat on specific numbers too much, rather than a performance range, which definitely mostly shows some big improvements. Okay, so let's put these numbers into context a bit. I mentioned fast SSDs and slow NVMEs. Well, I actually have a fairly fast SSD, SATA interface, in the i7 system and a fast SSD, NVMe, in the i9. So let's look at these performance numbers of each. Keep in mind that the NVMe drive in the i9 was one of the fastest available at the time. The i7 SATA SSD was very good for its day, but you'll see below in the numbers that the SATA interface really holds the solid state technology back but it's certainly a great performance swap for the existing hard drives connected via SATA interfaces back in the day. And for fun, I actually did a couple of transfers directly between the two PCs just to be able to compare the NAS to accessing the PCs, especially for anyone that might only be doing this with two PCs versus deploying a NAS. I've already given the benchmark numbers for each system's local disk. So this is really about the network connection and the speed of the disks in the systems. Keep in mind that the SATA SSD will be a limiting factor for each transfer in both the read and write speeds relative to the i9's much faster NVMe. Yeah, you know, it is interesting to see because you have this Thunderbolt technology, Thunderbolt 3, which is theoretically rated for 40 gigabits per second. Granted, you had a, a 20 gigabit per second cable kind of constraining it, but still 40, 20. But yet the 10 gigabit Ethernet connection technology pretty much exceeded it in almost every case. You know, in this faster is better world that we live in, it is very interesting to know that sometimes the latest and greatest technology isn't always meaningful. It isn't always tangible. Sometimes getting the latest and greatest equipment 
doesn't necessarily match up to your use case. Keith, I think that's exactly the lesson that we wanted to learn today. So it might be an awesome bragging right to have 10 gigabit ethernet, but if it doesn't help you do what you do faster, and significantly so, then it's just a lot of money spent to have that bragging right. Now clearly for my scenario, the gigabit upgrade and even the Thunderbolt was a significant improvement, and especially if we look at the transfer rates between systems and accessing that same data. But for accessing the internet, there really is no benefit to providing a 10 gigabit pathway in your environment. So upgrading in that scenario is really just a significant waste of money. So I think you and I have talked enough. So we better let Lily and Addie close this episode out. For Keith and Bruce, we will see you actually, correction, you will see us on the next episode of Dad's Talk Tech. Hit like, subscribe, and ring the bell to get notified of new videos. Why hit the dislike button when it feels so good to hit like? It's right there calling your name.